our morning program for today. So if everyone would please take a seat. Our next presenter is going to be Dr. Dinah Berry, who is an Associate Professor of History at the University of Texas at Austin. She received her PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles, and her research interests include 19th century American history, comparative slavery, and Southern history. Her first book is Swing the Sickle for the Harvest is Right, Gender and Slavery in Antebellum, Georgia, and that was published by the University of Illinois Press in 2007. Her articles have appeared in the Georgia Historical Quarterly, the Journal of African American History, and the Journal of Women's History. The Organization of American Historians recently selected Dr. Berry as one of their distinguished lecturers. She has appeared on several syndicated radio and television shows, including NBC's Who Do You Think You Are, where she reconstructed the enslaved genealogy of film director Spike Lee. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Berry. Good morning. Thank you. How is everybody doing today? Good. Well, I wanted to thank um, the staff at Humanities Texas for inviting me. I always enjoy doing these workshops. Um, as I say when I come and do these, I, it's, it's a pleasure to interact with um, K-12 through educators. Um, we get sort of tucked away on our university campuses and we sort of lose touch sometimes, so it's very nice to be here. Um, I also want to thank Michael Gillette and Eric Lufer for, and Rachel Spradley for organizing this and inviting me to talk once again. Um, now, as I prepared for this workshop, I looked at the STAR standards for eighth grade, and much of what I intend to share today comes from the sections one, four, seven, and eight of the standards. But the bulk of my material comes from sections seven, B, and C, which deals with, in particular, with slavery, okay? Now, I decided to organize my remarks around internet accessible um, images of this history and because what I find is that most undergraduate students that I've taught at public institutions are very visual, okay? And I'm sure your students are quite visual as well. They're also quite high tech. They know how to use the internet. They are very internet savvy. They, um, and I think that it's nice to teach students in a way that's a very familiar environment for them. And when they have that sense of familiarity, it makes the learning process fun, it makes it accessible, and I think that the students will enjoy the way you um, teach this material to them. So one of the questions that I wanted to ask you all, I, I like to interact with you, is um, what do your students, or what do you think your students know about slavery? Anything? Do they know? Do they have a background? Have they been exposed to it? Have they read slave narratives? Do they understand? The, the general history of slavery in the United States. Does anyone want to share what their students know, if anything? Okay. She said they know people were enslaved and that they were African American. Gentlemen, sir? Uh, mostly that, there was, that all the slavery was in the South, uh, that they were all black. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so, gen I'm sorry? From Africa. From Africa. Okay, so generally, all slaves were black. Slavery was, was um, reserved for mostly the southern United States, right? So these are some of the kinds of assumptions that they come into the classroom. So hopefully today's conversation and the afternoon workshop will help dispel some of those myths and provide some specificity for you all when you're teaching this material. Um, do you feel like your school districts um, are comfortable with this topic? Because I know when I was reading through the, the standards, it took till I think standard number seven or eight before they actually listed the word um, slavery, like the institution. A lot of it was like Civil War and Reconstruction, and then it would say like the divide between the North and South. But there's almost like a hesitancy to even the t with the term slave. So it is a part of American history. We're going to talk about it, and it is something that now it's in the standards that we're going to teach, and hopefully your students will find a way to be comfortable with this topic. Okay, and a lot of that is how we present it to them, right? How, we, how comfortable we are with that material. So whatever you decide to do in, in your classrooms, I would make sure you, you know, figure out which documents you're comfortable sharing. You know, there may be aspects of the institution of slavery that um, are uncomfortable for you. Talk about that. I mean, I find that it's much more easy to be open with the class about things that bother you or that, that seem disturbing or are hard for you to read. Um, and just also ask your students to be comfortable with how they receive the material, because people receive it differently. Sometimes people are overcome with emotions that they didn't expect or know that they had, and they didn't expect to approach a text 
or a story or a narrative or a document. They didn't expect to walk away with a certain feeling, okay? So just pay attention to that as well. Um, one of the things that I do, though, when I begin teaching about slavery, though, is I talk about how Africans were captured and brought to America. Now, that may not be something that's required, but I think it's important that Africans didn't just show up on our shores um, fresh and ready to work, right? So it's important for us to think about, a, to, to bring the students into that. So I have a quick little sort of five-minute spiel on the um, transatlantic slave trade and getting Africans to um, the Americas, okay? Um, and this is a good point of entry because the movement in Africans across the Atlantic to New World communities was, quote, the largest forced migration in world history. So when you think about that and you provide that context, they will understand that this is a major movement of people, a forced migration of people that is still the largest in, world's his in world history. Now, this is the context that we will begin um, our understanding of slavery. The majority of African slaves were brought to the United States, or what became the United States, um, from, and they were taken from 3,500 miles of coastline along the West African coast, okay? And so sometimes when you show them a visual map, all of the maps and images that I have here today, I have um, the citations for them for you. These are all available on the internet and you can use them in your classroom, okay? None of this stuff is hidden and if you have a question about some of them or how to use them, I'm happy to talk about that this afternoon as well. So you show them this image of the coastline, this 3,500 miles of coastline, um, and the slave trade dated from the 15th through the 19th centuries. So you think about this long time period, a long geographic span from which Africans were taken from the coastline. Um, in the north, you see from the um, Seneg Senegal River in West Africa, south down to present day um, and Mo Mozambique and Angola. So you'll see that on the bottom end there. Um, you also, we do know that there were also Africans brought from Eastern Africa, and that's a, an area of the slave trade, and we're now looking at more of the slave trade in the Indian Ocean. So we're starting to learn more about that. That's just a sort of side caveat. It's not anything that, um, that I'm sure that we'll, the students will be tested on for their standards, okay? Um, now, it's interesting when we talk about the slave trade, some of the early history, and if you were even to look at the historiography, what historians say, how historians study or teach history, the historiography of the slave trade began with this discussion of numbers. You know, how many were displaced? How many were taken from Africa? You know, what was the, what was the journey like? Um, and so the early scholars in the 1970s and 1980s were trying to figure out how many people were taken. And most scholars have figured upon, um, that are somewhat comfortable with the figures, 10 to 20, I'm sorry, 10 to 12 million individuals were taken, okay? Now there are other scholars, when they talk about this, um, they have figures that are a lot larger. So you might see textbooks that say 50 million or 100 million. Why do you think there might be some large discrepancies within the numbers and why from 10 to 12 million to 50 to 100 million? Yes? Lack of accurate records. Lack of accurate records. What else? Fraud. Fraud. Okay. What else? Very good. How many actually arrived? So the 10 to 12 million are based on records that are now online accessible because of a team of scholars that have been working on this material for over 20 years, um, headed by David Eltis at Emory University. And there's a slave voyage database that's online that you can go in and you can use this in class. It's a great exercise where you can have students trace a particular ship. You can choose a place that they um, it depart, um, left, like you want to use the Bight of Benin, so you can look at ships from the Bight of Benin, follow a particular ship, see where it went, and how many slaves were taken at each port, and then how many slaves arrived. So the large discrepancy in the numbers comes from the fact that some people are just calculating how many actually landed in New World communities, but other scholars are looking at how many were taken from their villages and their communities in different parts of Africa. Does that make sense? So you're going to see a wide range. It doesn't mean that, that um, people are incorrect. It's just how they choose to count the numbers, okay? So that's one thing. So 10 to 12 million is safe. You'll see that more often than any other numbers because those are the records that we know are accurate. We actually now have them online. We can read them. We can look at them. We can find out how the cargo, the cargo of human, human chattels were, were described, okay? Oftentimes people were listed as numbers, like number six, number seven. They didn't have names. Um, so when you look at the ship records, you can also show the lack of humanity that's even in the trade. And you can talk about that with your students as well. Now, um, the recent scholarship, though, from scholars on 
the history of the transatlantic slave trade, has moved more into this shift to understanding the human side. Um, so there's now a number of studies on the human aspect of the transatlantic slave trade, where they're trying to know what was life like for those in the belly of the ship? What was life like in the hold? And because of narratives like Alauda Equiano's narrative, which is also available online, um, you can now have your students read portions from an African perspective of what it was like to be on a slave ship. Okay, and you can, you can um, pair that with images of slave ships, which I'll show you in a minute, which you have in your packet. Um, and then you can also look at the voyages from the transatlantic slave trade. So you can understand how Africans arrived. Does that make sense? Okay, so here you have um, the triangular trade, which is this market, this, this triangular trade, the map of the trade should be in your packet. How many Africans do you think came to what we now refer to as the United States? What percentage do you think came? I mean, you kind of have a little answer right here on this chart, right? But um, typically, when we talk about the slave trade, scholars and students in my classes are, even in, at the college level, are very surprised to find out that only four to six percent of those Africans taken from different parts of Africa were brought to what became the United States. That's a surprising figure because most students assume, because we live in the United States, that the majority of the slaves came here. But actually, Brazil and the Caribbean had the largest numbers of Africans, um, the largest numbers of Africans went to South America, particularly um, Brazil and parts of the West Indies, okay? So around 42% went to Brazil, and about 36 to 38% went to the Caribbean islands, all right? So that's another thing that to give the students a little bit more perspective on the trade. It helps them. Um, now most Africans, this is a, this is a picture of the, um, the ship, and I'm sure some of you have seen this image before, it's a very famous image of the Brooks. It's a great visual um, for students to understand how tightly packed they were um, and to understand a little bit of this journey to the United States. A lot of times in our U.S. history classes we just begin with African slaves being here, but there's a disconnect between how they got here, okay? So most of them were captured in their villages, and you can use an excerpt of Equiano to talk about how he, was, he and his sister were playing, they were unsupervised by adults, and they were captured and then taken into slavery. Um, and one of the things that he says, I remember reading this for the first time when I was an undergrad, that um, he was so su surprised when he saw a body of water as large as the Atlantic Ocean. He had never seen anything that, that wide. So I always ask students to think about, like try to understand this transition, you know, this, this transition from living a certain way and being in your community with your family and then being captured and taken to a place where a lot of the people around you don't speak the same language, don't have the same ethnic group or their, their ethnicity is different. You're, you're, um, there's so many different things that are unfamiliar to you, including visual, like bodies of land that you have not seen, that, did, that you didn't even know existed beyond wherever your purview was of travel, right? So this is a very shocking experience and I think it's important to understand that when most Africans arrived um, in the, the northern, um, in the New World, um, they were starved, they were hungry, they were um, confused, they had been completely displaced, they were depressed. So you think about all the different emotional um, responses that might happen to one and then have to shift into that into to becoming plantation slaves, okay? And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, another image that I like to show, it's not the most um, comfortable image, but it does show Africans in spoon fashion on, on the enslaved ship, which is one of the ways they describe it as being books on a shelf. Um, um, very little room to breathe, um, very close quarters, and um, you can understand why the um, conditions were so unhealthy. They were chained um, at their ankles, sometimes their necks, depending on the ship and the, and the structure of the ship. And we've, we now have scholars that are looking at the dimensions of the ship, trying to understand the hold, how long that they were on water, uh, which ports they stopped at and for how long. So they're, they're now trying to reconstruct the trade in a way that gives us greater understanding of the experience of the Middle Passage. So that's very important. Now in the early part of the trade, the first 200 years of the trade, um, men outnumbered women. So you've probably heard of this and, and students always assume, well, the men were brought over because they were stronger, they could do more work. But what we learn later as slavery evolves and develops into plantation societies in the United States is that men and women worked the fields. Women actually were in higher numbers in the fields than men in the later period of slavery. So by the time slavery was a mature institution, um, and because of the need of natural reproduction and the fact that women could reproduce and 
provide additional sources of labor, then that becomes um, something that you see a shift in the numbers when we're looking at numbers in the transatlantic slave trade. Does that make sense? Okay, so when you'll, you'll see stuff in books that talk about um, men outnumber women two to one, but that does change over time as they understand the importance of natural reproduction, all right? Children typically only represented about 10 to 15 percent of the quote unquote cargo. And um, as we mentioned, the, the journey sometimes in the early period of the trade lasted three to four months. And by the later period, the last 200 years of the trade, they were able to get ships over here because of better shipping industry, right? The better, you know, the quality of the ships were better. They had better navigation routes and maps. So they were able to get in six to eight weeks, um, six to eight weeks from um, one shore to the other. And so that's a lot different. So why do you think this was called the Middle Passage? Does anyone know? Has, have you guys, you've heard that term, right? So why do you think they refer to it as the Middle Passage? You want to take a guess? Sir? Well, in the time of the trade, it was the second leg of that trade before it came to the uh, United States. Exactly. So it's the middle leg. So the first is when you think about the trade, you have people from England or you know, going to Africa and then picking up slaves along the coastline that we saw on that first slide, then going to New World Plantation Society. So the middle passage is that middle leg of the triangular trade. So the students will understand that there's great maps online with the triangular trade so that just to let them know that Africans didn't just show up here, okay? I think it's really important to, to start with that. So that's essentially my little five to six minute spiel on the, the transatlantic slave trade. I'll be happy to talk about it a little bit more um, this afternoon in our breakout sessions if you have questions. Um, but I do want to say one point of clarification that I still find students have trouble with. And that is the transatlantic slave trade, the traffic in human beings to the United States, ended in 1808. That's a very important date, okay? It ended in 1808 in the United States. But that does not mean that slave trading ended in the United States. Okay, and we'll talk about the domestic slave trade shortly. But the transatlantic is obviously the one that, with the trade of Africans being brought to the New World, but the domestic slave trade is going on at the same time, which is the traffic amongst the states in the United States, okay? The, inner, the intra traffic and trade in, in human beings, all right? It's very important. Um, students have a tendency to get confused with the two dates, um, understanding when slavery ended. When the, when the transatlantic slave trade ended. And um, I think it's important to know that there was still traffic in Africans being brought to other communities like Cuba and Brazil um, after 1808. But in the United States, it was illegal to bring in Africans after 1808. Now, there is a scholar um, at Texas A&M, Ernest Obodeli Starks. He writes about the illegal traffic in, tra in um, Africans being brought from 1808 up until the Civil War, 1865. So we do know that even though it was illegal, there were still African slave ships being brought to, to the United States, all right? Um, and some of those famous cases are, there's great documents online, which I can talk to you guys about this afternoon, that are useful if you want to, if you're doing a, a, something on the transatlantic or the domestic slave trade. Now, one of the things that I would like to shift to now is, um, before I, before I shift to the difference between indentured servitude and slavery, I wanted to give you two websites um, that will help you with this. The first one is the Slave Voyages website. Um, that's the Emory University material on the transatlantic slave trade where you can actually trace all of the different voyages, okay? So it's like you, just, you can do a Google search for slave voyages and find it very easily. And it's very user friendly. They've got instructions on there. There's maps. There's all kinds of uh, really, really good sources on there. Then also, when, you're, when you want to look at both the migration patterns in general in world history, the Schoenberg Center in, in um, New York has a great website called In Motion. In Motion. And it's with the Schoenberg Center for Amer um, African American History and Culture. And it's um, the African American Migration Experience. So it's In Motion, A A M E dot O R G. In Motion. A -M -A -A -M -E .org. And what I like um, to have students do is there's a section on there that deals with the transatlantic slave trade. So you can open that unit. There's lesson plans on there. And they even have it by grade. Um, so that's also useful to give you some ideas of what you want to do in class. Those are very useful. The transatlantic slave trade, um, slave voyages website also has lessons. So I think those are both very useful to give you ideas. You don't have to use the exact ones that they, 
the offer, but it can give you some suggestions on how you might want to structure, or even give you documents and questions to ask of your students, okay? Now, does anyone know the difference between indentured servitude and slavery? Yes, you're nodding. What is it? Exactly. So, very good. Thank you. The, the difference, the general difference, generally speaking, because students will ask, you know, they might ask questions about that, because you'll also see Africans referred to as servants. And so you, it's always useful to clarify that for them. Indentured servitude was, actually, as she said, it's their term limits. They, most people were brought over to the New World communities, and to pay their passage, they were serving, they were serving as servants for four to seven years, okay? Um, indentured servants often also received at least 25 acres, some more, um, after they finished their period of servitude. And um, they, it, this was not a lifetime condition, okay? So it's, it was a means of cheap labor. It was also to pay for your passage to the New World. And um, what happens is the first Africans that arrived, which you guys have read about, I'm sure, in 1619, on a Dutch man of war, they arrived in Jamestown, Virginia in 1619. Those Africans, those 20 odd Africans, were listed as servants, okay? And so one of the things I talk about, even after just contrasting the transatlantic slave trade, is I like to talk about how the first Africans that came here were not necessarily enslaved. Okay, there are a number of Africans that came with Portuguese explorers in the, 15, um, in the 1580s, and also the first Africans that arrived and landed at Jamestown came as indentured servants. They lived, and slavery was a gradual institution in the United States. It, it became a racialized institution over time, okay? It's very important to, to understand that as well. Um, slavery becomes racialized, though, because it's easier, quote unquote, I hate using terms like that, and I, I tell my students to sort of shy away from that, but Africans were more easily visibly um, identifiable, right, because of the color of their skin. Um, they had already brought them over from the transatlantic slave trade. They were completely displaced. Um, they had trouble trying to enslave Native Americans, partly because they knew the, the land and the geography and because of illness with contact with Europeans. So Africans became the, the um, workers of choice, for lack of a better phrase. And um, by 1640 in Massachusetts, slavery was legal. And by 1661 and 1663 in Virginia and Maryland, slavery was defined as racial slavery. And the status of the slave was defined by your mother. So what does that mean? That means that if your mother was a slave, then you were a slave. So you could have a, a free black father and an enslaved mother, and that the offspring of those two would be enslaved, okay? So the status of slavery is, defi is defined through um, the status of, of black woman, and Georgia was the only colony um, that had a ban on slavery for nearly the first 20 years of its founding. So that's a very, that's my, my research area is on Georgia history, and that was one of the things that sort of drew me to it. I was trying to understand why you know, this was so unique out of the 13 colonies to not allow slavery, and I wanted to know why, and I wanted to know more. Um, so let's move into dispelling the myth of slavery as a southern institution. Uh, most of our images of slavery, when we think about it, are these large-scale, you know, um, land, these, these big plantation manors, and fields and fields of cotton, right? But we do know that there was slavery in the North, and I think it's important for your students to know that. There were not any large-scale plantations in Northern communities because the land was not fertile for the type of crops that you find in the South. So a lot of the, the fact that the slavery was different in the North has to do with the type of land. Um, you also have more urban communities in the North, and so enslaved people that worked in Northern communities often worked as domestic servants in homes. Some of them worked in shipyards. Um, in urban communities, some of them worked in factories, like ironworks factories, foundries, and so forth. So there's, there's a very big difference between northern slavery, because you don't have these large-scale plantations, you don't have large concentrations of Africans um, living there. And um, we also have learned recently that slaves were owned, as, you, as some of you may have seen or heard, by universities, state governments, um, public works, 
Slaves built railroads in this country. So there's a number of places where you can look at slavery and move beyond the plantation and have your students do some comparative work between northern communities, ur northern urban communities um, versus southern rural communities. All right, so that's one thing to, to pay attention to. Um, it's also interesting, one way is to show students uh, runaway slave advertisements. There's a lot of them online that have advertisements from slaves in northern communities. Um, and so that also will give you a sense of teaching them about slave in the north. What kinds of things are written in the ad? How are they describing enslaved people? What are they wearing? Why did they run away according to the ad? Um, and so, and some of those are, so those are the, some of the key things I would look for. What are they asking for as a reward? Um, who, who might they have run with? Where might they be going? So you can learn a lot from runaway slave advertisements. Um, there's a great website called The Geography of Slavery and it's Virginia Runaway Slave Advertisements, The Geography of Slavery. What's nice about that website is that you can then go in and, and mount, you can map the routes that a person took. So you can study a slave and they'll tell you, you can read the ad and then you can click on another link and it'll show you how far they traveled. So you can look at where they, you know, whether or not they cross state lines, county lines, and so forth. Gives you a sense of the physical aspect of running away, okay? So you can use this ad and others in your lesson plans. Now I have another slide here that's in your packet um, that shows the divide, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. I think um, Professor Fuller will be talking about um, sectionalism and slavery, so I'm going to move um, through this one pretty quickly. But you'll see the line the 30, the, from the Missouri Compromise that basically divides the North and South. Um, but I also like this because it shows you where slavery was officially and legally abolished. And if you look at some of those, those dates in the northern communities, um, it's a little surprising because people assume that there was no slavery in the north. But this shows you when slavery, slavery was legally outlawed in northern communities. Um, very accessible. Also shows the percentages of the slave populations on the bottom left. So you can see the numbers of slaves in different communities. And this helps you teach the students visually about the regionalism in slavery in a very, very quick way. Um, a lot of times, this next slide is, um, a map of the Underground Railroad. A lot of times students will come in and they've gotten a lot of exposure to the Underground Railroad, um, particularly in elementary school. Um, I think that even in, at, for students in your grades, at eighth grade level, I think they're ready to get into some more deep political discussions of the abolitionist movement. And so some of the things I do in those sections I talk about, I, I have students read some pro-slavery documents and speeches and I contrast that with a slave narrative and a runaway ad and, you know, and, and some other documents which we'll look at this afternoon, like the David Walker appeal. Um, and I'll have the students do a debate about pro-slavery versus anti-slavery. And it's a good way to have them assume the role and assume the part so you can have them create a platform for supporting slavery and a platform against slavery. And you can use maps like these and other documents to, to do that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the domestic slave trade, 1808 to 1865, it really actually started before that. There was always a domestic traffic. It didn't start just when the transatlantic slave trade ended. Um, but this, I, I like this map because for your students, Texas is on here and you can see um, where slaves were coming from. And you can see that there's a trade um, coming around the, the Florida Panhandle into Texas and Galveston, which is very important for the, the later part of slavery. So this afternoon we're going to talk about David Walker's appeal, which is a document that um, was very controversial because it was a radical document about ending slavery. And uh, one of the things that we'll learn a little bit more about David Walker, you know, he was not, um, he was not born a slave um, because his mother was free but his dad was enslaved. And he grew up in, and he was born in Wilmington, North Carolina and then lived in Boston. He wrote this um, document from Boston. He worked. Um, in, in the clothing business and he had a shop along the shipyard so he interacted with a lot of, of blacks both um, slave and free and he actually sewed in um, portions of, this, of the, the David Walker's appeal in people's clothing and that's how it was able to get to the south so there's a, we'll talk about this this afternoon when we go over that um, then shifting briefly to slavery in the south which we'll, we'll talk about some more um, these are the kind of images that are probably more familiar to you all um, because you've thought about plantation slavery, you think about picking cotton. You may have seen the image of Gordon, um, the slave with the, um, the whip marks on his back. 
and um, even female domestic servants as well. So these are very common images of slaves, and this is, this, this is a way to sort of transition into thinking about what plantation slavery was like, but also balancing out this discussion with slavery in northern and in urban communities as well. Um, so how does slavery in the South differ? Um, briefly, we have a few more minutes, and then I'll open up to question and answer. But I want you to think about maybe one way is to show the different crops. So pick like cotton, rice, tobacco. You know, pick a state and pick a crop, and then get do a unit on that where you can talk about the various um, ways that that crop was produced. That slaves typically worked from sunup to sundown, um, and some of them had tasks. And some of them had a task system where they had a specific task of work that they had to complete in a given day, and then after that, they could then be free to work on their own. Um, I always found that they still had other work to do even after they finished, they completed their tasks, okay? But you can talk about some of this, the, the forms of slavery that your students would be more familiar with after having introduced them to slavery in the North. Um, you can use ads, runaway slave advertisements. Um, and I also like to do exercises where I show pictures. And I show images and we just, we dissect the image. We say, what can we learn about slavery? What do we learn about this plantation community? What, you know, and I have them really spend time with pictures. I, I've done entire class sections on using photographs. And students can really, like, looking at what they're wearing, how they're, how they're seated, what their posture is, you know, how many men, how many women, what their clothing looks like, whether they're wearing jewelry. Some pictures have slave women breastfeeding in them, you know. Some pictures, people are asleep. You know, photographs at this time took a very long time to, to take and they had to sit still for nearly an hour at this time. So you think about all those things, but you can break up your students in groups and have them look at maybe tobacco in Virginia and cotton in Georgia, you know, or cotton in Texas, if you will, and have them do a unit on that, and it really works out well. And students love it when you use, at least here in Texas, when you use the Texas slave narratives. So that's also useful. Those are also accessible online. I'm going to skip over this, but these are the great compromises over slavery. Um, I think you'll cover some of this in the next um, Professor Fuller's section. I'll just skip over these as well. These are just um, some, some of the topics we'll cover today in the afternoon. And then finally, I'd like to show um, broadsides or ads that have lists of slaves, and I asked people to, to look at how slave families were structured. What can we learn about enslaved people from this ad, and then maybe pair that with a photograph. You know, we have a lot of information that we can learn about people, about their family structure, about their age, about their work capacity, work capacity what kind of labor, where they labored, just from a broadside like this. And so this is a really visual document that I think students can use, along with the photos of the slaves. Um, we're going to talk about Greg's Dred Scott this afternoon as well, but this is a major case that deals with issues of citizenship and slavery, and um, we will cover that and talk a little bit about the difference in how the Missouri Compromise was basically unconstitutional because of this particular legislation. Slaves could, were not considered citizens. You could take them to a free, free state, and they still had to remain enslaved. That's the one-minute spiel on, on Dred Scott. And this is finally how slavery grows. You can see the regions, how it does become a much more southern institution on the eve of the Civil War. These are great images to show students. And finally, slavery ended um, not with the Emancipation Proclamation. It ended with the, the abolish the, the 13th Amendment as the official ending of slavery, which was first um, introduced January 31st of 1865 and ratified on December 6th. Um, it's a great way to end your class with talking about slavery in Texas because um, slaves did not know they were free until June 19th. This weekend we celebrate Juneteenth. And so you can look at how slaves in this state were delayed in knowing that they were emancipated by, if you look at it from when the war ends in April, a couple of months. Some people say it was two and a half years because they're dating that, the Emancipation Proclamation. But the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves in the Confederacy, right? but it was not necessarily enforced. So a lot of African Americans did not know they were free in Texas until June 19th of um, 1865 when um, the, the, um, civil, the Union General Granger read um, in Galveston the um, order that told them that slaves were no longer, um, that slave people were free in Texas as well as the United States. So I will close with that and I would like to open up the question and answer if you guys have any questions, thank you.
Yes. I was teaching seventh grade last year, so I was able to introduce some of this. Mm -hmm. That's good. I think that's a point where a question, in case you guys didn't hear, was what do you do with um, students that uh, are Hispanic and how they, they want to know where their, their position is? One of the things is you could talk about how, um, about slavery, how slavery was not legal in Mexico. And you can talk about how, you can look at the, the, the Mexico-Texas connection. That's the one way. And I, 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 my students in my undergraduate class often do a unit on that, where they're looking at the connection. Um, they would not be <coughs> enslaved. Um, and a lot of, but there was a lot of um, good interaction between Hispanics and African Americans at this time. A lot of African Americans were trying to run away to Mexico because they knew they were not enslaved if they, if they were able to get there. So um, you could have them do a unit on that and just know that there's a connection, but it's not the kind of connection that you find when you look at sla you know, slavery being racialized. It's racialized by people of African descent, OK? Yes? In your research, how did Obama I'm sorry? Oh, I'm asking you, how did you resolve the issue of him being a slave and then becoming a slave trader? I don't know that he would consider himself, that Laudia Ecuador would consider himself a slave trader. He would consider himself someone that was on slave ships. That was, but I don't know that he would consider himself actually having participated in trade. I don't think he would. I mean, he was on ships, but I don't think he considered himself as having the blood of Africans on his hands. You don't agree? Why? Well, when, when he was, after he bought his freedom, he has to start a conversation to transport slaves. And if you're, if you're assisting in transportation of slaves, then you're part of slavery. Does anyone else want to add to that? I think, I mean, the, the problem with Equiano is, I don't know if you've read Vincent Coretta's work, he argues that um, there were some discrepancies on whether or not Equiano, there's questions about whether or not the narrative was authentic, whether or not he was even born in, Af in West Africa, in, which is Igbo country, present day Nigeria. Um, and there, because of some diff discrepancies in the date of his birth certificate when he was baptized, so there's now a whole controversy on whether or not some of the things he's saying are accurate. And you also have to think about what he could say and how he had to protect himself. Um, you know, what, what is, and there was a, there's a great video that um, Henry Louis Gates did in, in when he went and visited, um, part, it was earlier in the 1990s, I think it was, and he visited um, parts of Africa and he went and met with this, I can't remember the name of the series, but I'll think about it and let you know this afternoon. But he went and visited um, some former African communities um, where they were slave traders. And he was you know, really looking forward to meeting with this woman, a descendant, to find out you know, why would you have blood on your hands? You know, why did your people sell my people into slavery is the question that he asked her. And she said at that time, um, you, were either, you, either traded or you, were, you either traded or you traded people. She's like, and that was a choice. She said, my family chose to trade because we didn't want to be traded. So I'm not, you know, I, it's hard for me to pass judgment or make statements about the choices people made, but I think it's something to think about when you put it into context of the kind of decisions that people were faced with. Yes, other questions? Well, on that, along that line, when Stephen Spielberg made Amistad, he Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, also the nice thing about, um, I use that film when I, when I want to show visual scenes of the um, transatlantic slave trade. There's also a really good HBO special called The Middle Passage. Very, it's, it's, I think you can get it online. It's very monotonous. It's like you're actually, the camera angle the, is rocking, like you're, on the like you're on the ship. And the students, it's just sort of like the day in life on a slave ship. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, the, it's very slow moving. Um, it's, it's narrated by Diamond Hinju, the, the same actor that played Sinke 
in, um, in the Amistad. And so you hear him not narrating over and he's talking about what life was like. And one of the things that I, you know, when I first started teaching the Middle Passage, you know, the students thought, oh, okay, well, I kind of got the point. And then I was like, but think about it. Imagine that that you just watched that you felt some of it was kind of monotonous. Imagine that for eight to 12 weeks. You know, that's their experience. And so then, at least today when I've used it, I used it last semester, students seem to appreciate it more than when I first started showing it maybe, you know, eight, seven years ago. Um, because they, they really think about, like, this is what it was like. And I can't even sit through a 50-minute class period or even a 10-minute clip of it is, was painful for some of the students to watch. But they were able to then understand the conditions and think, well, do you want to, would you rather be enslaved or have some semblance of your own, you know, self where you can work for yourself? Not that it's, you know, maybe working on a slave ship from our 21st perspective, century perspective seems, you know, hypocritical, right? Um, for others, it might have been an act of survival, right? Other questions? Eric. Yeah, actually, it's good. I just, um, I took a break from novels for a while, um, just because I was working on my own book, and I had, all my outside reading was history books. Um, but I, 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 I used historical novels in class, and this year I used two novels that worked really well together. One is by Valerie Martin, and it's called Property, and um, the other one is called Wench, and it's by Dolan Parker Valdez. Um, and both of those novels, the, the nice thing about it is Wench deals with the perspective of enslaved women who are in relationships with white men, their plantation owners. Their owners are married. It's based on a true story about enslaved women who were taken to this resort in Ohio um, over the summer for six weeks every summer with their um, enslaved, um, their, slave, their slavers. And their wives weren't there with them, so they were the plantation mistresses or their concubines, and they would have these vacations with their, men, their male friends. They'd go hunting during the day, and they were with these enslaved women in the evening. And so it's the perspective of, of enslaved women in, that, in those relationships. Very powerful. Stuff that we can't, we can get to some of that through like Salvoia Glimpse's work at Duke, um, out of the House of Bondage, she writes about this. But pairing it with the, a novel gives you a little bit more um, entree into imagine, imagining these relationships beyond the documents that have not survived, right? Um, the property by Valerie Martin is about the white woman's perspective on her husband having relationship with enslaved women. So it's really powerful to look at how, from her perspective, how she despises him, how she sees things, what she, how she feels about these relationships. You know, she's not able to have children. He has children by an enslaved woman. You know, there's all this really, really interesting material in there. So I do find that using historical novels by it, also contextualizing them are very good. Um, Jubilee is by Margaret Walt Walker is also another very good novel on slavery, on plantation slavery. Um, that I think is useful. I'm drawing a blank on. Oh, um, if anyone likes Octavia Butler for those science fiction um, readers, Kindred is another very, very good study of slavery. So those are some of the ones I've used in class. And students, that's another good way to do it is to get, assign a novel and then bring in a lesson plan that is based on some of the websites and some documents, some actual history documents. And they'll, they'll be more, it'll be, a process for them that's a little bit more enjoyable, not as painful because they're telling a story and they don't, it's not as real, but you can make it real by bringing in the documents. Does that make sense? Because sometimes slavery is too real. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. It's too real for some students to really address and it makes them uncomfortable. That's just been my experience. Um, but so but by bringing in a novel and then bringing in the documents, I think that's a nice way to, to open up that conversation. And students seem much more comfortable talking about the novels and we, they talked about the characters. And then I said, okay, well, who was this like in history? Who in, who in historical, you know, who in history is, does this woman represent or does this man represent? And how do we understand them? Yes. There's a scene in property that's not. Um, because of the name? Because of the name. The material, yeah. Um, do you, did you have one that you're thinking of? 
What you could do is use sections of Wancho property, like an excerpt from it or part of a chapter. Um, it's not like, you know, it's not like every page is covered with, with material they can't cover. But the reality is there are slave children that were younger than the students that you teach that were witnessing things much more graphic than what you're going to read in these books. Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand. I understand. I think we have time for one more. Yes, sir. Well, part there's a there's a all, pretty much all of what you just said. Um, first is the ships landed in the Caribbean often first, and they went through the enslaved people went through what is called a seasoning process, where they were left on plantations where people had a lot of the American slaveholders had estates in the Caribbean, and so they were brought to the Caribbean first to get them you know, to have them survive the Middle Passage, to get them healthy again, sort of training them into what slavery was going to be like. And after a few years, they would then transfer them to the, what became the United States. Um, there's vast lands, much larger scale plantations, 500, you know, to 1,000 slaves on them. So you can have a larger concentration of slaves in those particular communities than you could um, in what became the United States. I think that's all we have time for now. But I know I'm happy to talk about more of this or any of these questions this afternoon. And I hope you have a chance to look at your documents before this afternoon as well. Thank you very much.